the recording. So welcome to Basecamp number seven. This is a StarNet Foundation initiative uh, alongside community members from, from the StarNet, as we have here Pierre. Uh, wait a second. Sorry, I just got a message from Google Meet. Yeah, so we have people from the community here as Pierre, uh, Ademola, Robert, and then we have Omar and myself from the StarNet Foundation. And this is the very first session of cohort seven. This is the third cohort we do this year, actually. So what is Basecamp? So Basecamp is a way to onboard developers into the StarNet ecosystem. We, we assume you have some foundational knowledge on programming. Maybe you're not an expert on Web3, that's fine. Uh, but the idea is that at the end of Basecamp, you should have the tools and the knowledge to start building on the ecosystem and just to continue your journey, just going deeper into different verticals that you're gonna find uh, on StarNet. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, this is an initiative from the StarNet Foundation, although it got started uh, from Starkware, where, where we all used to work before. Uh, for this cohort, we have uh, six sessions, so it, one session per week. So we have six weeks, and all gonna be taught live over Zoom, sorry, or over Google Meet. Uh, for each session, you know, you have the chat here to, to interact with your uh, other base campers, with the trainers. There's a Q&A session also that I encourage you to use because when there's so many people in the chat, it's easy to get some questions to get lost. So if you go to the bottom right in the activity section, there's gonna be a Q&A uh, section that you can use to just to ask a question. Uh, you can also vote for the question that you like the most. So we answer them in priority. Uh, we also have a private Discord channel. Uh, many of you have already been added. Uh, the ones of you who have not been added is because either you didn't provide your Discord username, you just sign up for Basecamp, or you did, but you didn't join the StarkNet uh, Discord server. So we cannot add you to, to the channels if you don't belong already to the server. Uh, and finally, uh, you use the Discord channel for interacting with your peers, um, Robert, Pierre, and Kelvin are also in the in the Discord channel. So it's a way to collaborate not only with us from the foundation, but also from the community itself. And because we're gonna give you some homework that is optional for you to do if you want to improve your skills, make sure to you know collaborate your, with people going through this course as well. So if you get stuck at some point. Okay, so let me introduce all the trainers for the whole of Basecamp, right? So obviously this is me. Uh, David Barreto, I'm a StarNet developer advocate. Uh, I work for the StarNet Foundation. Um, I live in Canada, but I was born in Venezuela, so obviously my first language is Spanish. You can find me here on Twitter, and also have a personal blog that you can also follow me. Uh, and I also write a lot on the StarNet EDU Medium account. Uh, we have here Robert, maybe Robert, you're here. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, David. So my name is Robert. Uh, I'm a blockchain engineering at Extropy. Um, I'm born and uh, living in Romania as a uh, current language is uh, it's English, Romanian, and Hungarian. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can check my Twitter and uh, reach out to me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Robert, this is the second time you participate in Basecamp, if I'm not mistaken, right? You also you were a teacher last time. Yes, correct. So just to give a bit of background, I've participated in the Basecamp session number two, and then in Basecamp number four, I have uh, did the testing session. And then uh, this uh, Basecamp number seven, I'll do this uh, testing session again, and uh, looking forward uh, uh, to it and teaching you how to uh, work with Foundry. Awesome. So, Robert, you're a success story of Basecamp from, from a student to teacher. Nice. Yes. Nice. We have we have a, a demo like Kelvin. Kelvin, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Um, thanks. Um, Kelvin Ademola. Um, born and lives in Nigeria. I speak two languages, English and Yoruba. And you can reach out to me on Twitter via my handle, Code Whisperer. I also like it. I'm, I'm also a product of um, Basecamp. I think that was um, Basecamp 4. Yeah. So. Also, another former base camp now joining the. Yeah, Omar. Uh, so, sorry, David. Just real quick, uh, do you have the Discord link where people can join? 
Okay, so about uh, this course, so you cannot just join directly because it's a private discourse. So you first make sure that you you join the the discourse server from Starknet. And after this session, I'm gonna ask the mod of the discord to go through the list again and try to add people from the list that we couldn't add before. So just make sure to join a Starknet server. And then after this session ends, I'll make sure to ask them to do a second review of all the people that we couldn't add into the channel before. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, David. Yeah. So as I was saying, uh, yo, Kelvin, first time uh, here as a, as a teacher. So he actually is going to be part of this particular first session uh, in the second half of it. And now we have Pierre. Pierre, to give some few words. Yeah, sure. Hi, guys. So yes, Pierre, I'm a StackNet blockchain developer at Scription Labs. Um, I'm French, but I live in Mexico. So feel free to reach me in the languages you, you see here. Uh, you can read me, reach me on Twitter and uh, uh, Telegram with the same handle, uh, everything. And like the other guys, I just started in this April in the court four as a student with Robert, David, and Omar as teachers. And now uh, happy to be in the other side to share with you some cool stuff about Stagnet. Cool, happy to have you here, Pierre. Uh, all right, who else we have here? I think we have also now one more person. Oh, well, Henry, of course. Henry is our, our boss at the Starknet Foundation. I don't think he's here in this call right now, but he's going to be the one uh, teaching the session about the Starknet architecture. Of course, he's, he's French, but he also speaks Spanish. And apparently, he speaks also Portuguese, which I didn't know. Uh, and you can find it in this uh -huh. computer handle. And we have Darlington, which I don't believe is in this call, or maybe he is, but I didn't make him a co-host. I have to check. Uh, but he's an ecosystem associate at Argent. He's also from Nigeria, as uh, Kelvin. Uh, I speak English, and you can find him on this Twitter account. Um, great. I think that's all of us. Perfect. So, so this is going to be the first of six sessions that are going to be uh, be part of the whole Basecamp cohort. So, session one is going to be about fundamentals. This session, session two next week, is going to be all about uh, Cairo. Then session three is going to be about Starknet, session four about testing, session five about architecture, and session six about front end. And now remember that, P Pierre, you're actually doing session three is Starknet because then when you do the, the smart contract, session two is all only vanilla Cairo. Uh, OK, that's a correction. Session four testing is the one Kodra is participating. Session five is what Henry is going to provide. And session six is the one Darlington is going to be driving. So before we start, let me just clarify different names here, because it's a common confusion every time that I go uh, and introduce the technology to new people. So probably you've heard about Starkware, StarkX, StarkNet, and the StarkNet Foundation. So the question is, what's the difference between all of these terms? So Starkware is the a company based in Israel, who is the one actually developing the technology that we know today as a StarkNet, and also StarkX. StarkX was actually the first technology developed by Starkware that used um, the Stark's validity proof. And StarkX is the technology behind things, for example, like Immutable or Sorer or DYDX, right? StarkX is, is in a, a layer two, but it's a validium layer two. It's not a, it's not a rollup. And also, StarkX is permissioned. Not anyone can go and, and use it. You have to come into some contract agreement with, with Starkware to use the system. That's why a StarkNet was born, because a StarkNet is actually a layer two rollup, uses similar technologies, the same Stark validity proof used by StarkX, but now it's a permissionless protocol that anyone can use, anyone can deploy their smart contracts there, so you don't have to get in any particular uh, contract with StarkWare. And then you have the StarkNet Foundation, that is uh, it's a non-profit organization whose goal is to promote and to, and to help to grow the StarkNet ecosystem. So that's it for introduction about Basecamp. We can now actually can get started with the fundamentals. Before I move on, let me see if there's any question in the Q&A. Um, so Andre is asking, what are the required stacks for the course? So I guess you're asking about the technology stack. Uh, for that, basically, you're going to need SCARP to manage uh, compilers or the Cairo compiler. And eventually, you're going to need as well 
uh, a wallet, a Stargate wallet, could be Argent, could be Bravos. You're gonna require a Stargate to use as a CLI to talk to, to Stargate using the command line. And the Stargate uh, Foundry as well for testing. I think Robert is gonna be using that tool. Uh, another question, installing SCAR is a hostel on Windows, using archive, the link is broken, how do I bypass? That's a good question. That's a, that's a question only for the SCAR team, so maybe if, if you can actually either open an issue, or I think in the Discord server we have a channel for SCAR that you can try to use. I, I don't have experience with Windows, I only ever use Mac and Ubuntu. Victor is asking, which is better, Argent or Bravos? I, I, I cannot say. I uh, have to be a neutral participant here because those are two important builders in the ecosystem. But, you know, give both a try. You know, it's, there's only two wallets, very easy to, to try both and to see which one you like better. David, right. people are asking for the meaning of the logo of Starnet and also why I wasn't introduced. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Omar, I forgot about you. <laughs> Again. Uh, no problem. Look, you choose yourself. <laughs> No, 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 I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I, I'm only supporting. So, so yeah. yeah. But well, what Omar is the meaning of the logo? Ah, yeah. Which logo? The Stargate logo? Yes, that's a good question, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I guess inspired by Pepsi. I guess something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Colgate. <laughs> uh, all right. So session one: Stargate fundamentals. So, what topics are we covering today? So first of all, we're gonna talk about why Cairo was created in the first place, then why Starnet. I give some hint of why at the beginning when I talk about Starnet and StarkX. Then we're gonna go a little deep dive into Starnet and to the, the technology. We're gonna have a 10 minutes break, so you can have a coffee, go to the washroom, and then we're gonna give it over to, to Ademola so he can actually do a, a live session showing you how to install a wallet, how to use it, how to deploy it, how to interact with a block explorer, and how to use a bridge as well to move funds back and forth between layer one and layer two. Right, so question one is why Cairo? So I like to explain the reason of why Cairo was created with, with an example. So imagine that you're the head of the space exploration of a small country, and your job is to send small spacecraft to, to Mars, right? So of course, to send this small spacecraft, you have to answer two important questions. What's the best launch window? Like when during the year is the best time to launch it? And what's gonna be the best trajectory to get there in order to minimize the amount of fuel that you require? Because that is a very important variable because the, the less fuel you use, the smaller the spacecraft can be. So of course, this is a complicated calculation. So probably you are gonna ask the team of engineers to just create the algorithm to calculate those two variables could be something like Rust, a very high performance language. So what happens is the engineers, then after working for a while, they go back and say, hey, this is the program that is gonna calculate these two very important variables. But the problem that we have is that this requires so much computing power that we need a supercomputer to execute it. We cannot just execute it in a single computer or a, a normal computer because it will take way too long. So we need this special computer. And the issue is that, you know, you are part of a small country, you don't have a supercomputer in the country or in your agency. But there's a rival country that has agreed to actually collaborate and allow you to use their supercomputer. But the issue that you have is obviously this is a rival country, but you still decide to give it a go. So the way that we work is that basically you give them your code, right? They will execute it for you. And then after a while, they're gonna come back with the result. But then you have another issue, right? How do you know that that result is actually the, the output of your program. What if the supercomputer malfunctioned at some point, just, you know, uh, a bit just flipped in some calculation? Or what about if a rival spy agency just sabotage and change a little bit the result, but just enough to derail completely the program? You don't know, right? You, you have to trust that that supercomputer actually did the work that you were expected uh, to do. So now let's, think that instead of your engineers creating this, this program using Rust, they will use Cairo, right? So in this scenario now, obviously you give them the Cairo code for them to execute and they will execute it. But now, not only they're gonna give you the result back, they're also gonna give you back what's called a validity proof 
of the execution. And this validity proof, you can actually run it on your computer. You can verify mathematically. And you can have certainty that if that proof is valid, the result that you're getting is actually the output of your program. So you have certainty that the execution uh, didn't fail, either for, for failure of the hardware or because someone trying to modify the execution. You have full certainty that that is the actual output of your program. So in, in a nutshell, when you have validity proof, you're able, a regular computer is able to keep a supercomputer honest. Because if the supercomputer even had a failure in the hardware, that proof will be invalid and you will detect it right away. So the verification is very cheap to do. That's why you can use a regular computer for that. I'm gonna stop here and there for questions, but I'm just gonna keep going just to not break the flow. Some of the features of Cairo is that, first of all, it creates what's called a provable program or a program that you can actually derive the validity proof of its execution. Cairo runs on top of the Cairo VM and that's why Starknet is not deemed to be EVM compatible is because we have our own virtual machine that is custom made for a provable language like Cairo. Its syntax is inspired by Rust. I would say it's like 95% the same or 90% the same. Uh, so if you have some previous knowledge with Rust, picking up Cairo is gonna be very easy. Um, if you're only learning Cairo for the first time, then you're basically learning Rust at the same time, at least most of it. Uh, it has a very similar ownership model. If you're familiar with Rust, you're gonna see the same uh, with Cairo. It's a strongly typed language, which allow you to have more interesting static analysis as well. And interesting enough, you can use Cairo outside of a Starknet. So this is a different from Solidity. You can only use Solidity in the EVM virtual machine for, for Ethereum or for any other EVM compatible chain. But Cairo is a general purpose program. Like think about the connection between Python and Django is the same between Cairo and Starknet. You can use Cairo on its own as we call it vanilla Cairo, or you can use Cairo to write Starknet smart contracts. But for me, the best feature of Cairo is that it uses CK technology under the hood, but you as a developer, that's completely transparent to you. So you don't need to know anything about how CK work to be a proficient Cairo developer. Let me stop for a moment. Uh, Omar, you have to raise your hand. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there was a question about what is the stone prover? And also if this is going to be recorded, uh, Pierre already answered that this will be recorded. So in case you want to revisit the information, you can find it. Okay. So David, what is the stone prover? All right, so the stone prover is the, is the open source version of the prover that Starknet and StarkX are using under the hood. So we're gonna go at some point, we're gonna talk about the architecture on a high level. You're gonna see where the prover actually fits in the whole flow. And the prover is actually the main module of Sharp, right? So now we have made that open source. I think right now it's written in C++. So uh, many more implementations probably are gonna come out of that. Uh, would it be surprised if a Rust implementation is the first one to appear? And it's gonna open the door for more interesting use cases like layer threes, for example. I'm gonna remove some of the question already answered just to make sure I'm looking at new questions. Oh, uh, yeah, Omar, please. Uh, oh, yes, on show you can you can put on answer. So only the unanswered questions appear to you. Oh, uh, okay. okay. And there's there's an unanswered question. Yeah. Is Cairo like a framework to to write smart contracts for Rust? For example, Jan, Django for Python, or is it not like a framework? What do you think? So so a Starknet will be kind of like that, kind of like Django in, in the case that provides you some special syscalls and library calls that you can use to create a smart contract, especially using meta programming. Uh, so some special attributes that you can use to, you know, common things like a struct, like a module. When you use a special attribute for that on a Starknet, it actually creates more code that allows you to use that as a smart contract or have a special function within the smart contract. Now, Cairo is not Rust. It's just similar to Rust but it has a very different compiler, right? So it only shares the syntax and maybe the ownership model, but nothing else. Thank you. No more answers, no more questions. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Uh, all right, let's keep going. So if you have never seen Cairo before, so let me give you some uh, sneak peek of how it looks like. So this, for example, this is a struct in Cairo. 
Uh, this is how you define a custom data types, and then you can find the, the members of the stroke. And you know, in this case, I'm using scalar types, but it could be more other custom data types. Uh, this is how you define a trait, which is basically like a blueprint for functionality. This is very similar to Rust as well. So this trait has to, let's call it methods. Uh, and you can define the trait only the method signature, because then you can actually create an implementation of the trait and define how those functions are actually going to behave. So this, we can see the first difference with Rust. In Rust, you don't have name implementations, but in Cairo, you do have. So that's why we have the, here the rectangle geometry is an implementation that you can use it uh, almost as a type as well. Now that is the like vanilla Cairo. Let me give you a sneak peek of how a smart contract, a starting smart contract written in Cairo will look like. So as you can see here, our smart contract is called simple storage and it uses a module, but the module has the attribute stagnant contract. And that's an example of how we can use meta programming on a stagnant and Cairo, very similar to how we do it in on Rust as well. Uh, to define internal storage of the smart contract, you use a struct uh, and then you use the attribute storage. Then to define the public interface of your smart contract, you use a trait that is, uh, you know, annotated with this uh, starting interface attribute. And here's obviously it's just the public interface. So, so the signature of the function, you can see that it expects a generic. I know this is a lot to take right now is I'm just giving you like a sneak peek. We're going to go back in more detail about that, especially Pierre is going to give you a workshop coding a smart contract from scratch that you're going to learn more. But for now, I'm just going to give you the taste of the syntax. Uh, you see that it expects a generic. This generic is actually the, the state of the smart contract. And you can see that if the this internal state is passed as a reference, means that this function can actually modify the state. But if it gets a snapshot, we're going to talk more about snapshot in the next session when we talk about Cairo. It actually means that this function can only read from the state. It cannot modify it. Finally, because we define the public interface, now we can actually define the implementation inside of a smart contract using the external attribute. And so you can see that basically we define the body of those two functions. So you can see here, how do we write to storage and how do we read from storage? One, one again, uh, this is just an example for you to have an idea how it looks like. I, I'm not expecting you to understand all of this. Let me stop for a moment to see. Yeah, Omar. Yeah, so, right. so there's a question. Uh, if you need to learn Rust in order to learn Cairo, uh, of course it's helpful. If you learn Rust, uh, Cairo will be very easy for you, but it is not a require me, requirement. For me, if you know object-oriented programming, that is enough to understand Cairo. We have a fantastic book called the Cairo book that was actually created by the community. It's very similar to the Rust book, if you read that one. So no, you don't have to know Rust. You can just read, read the Cairo book. And Pierre just shared the, the link to the book. And that's all you need to know, basically. Perfect. That's all the questions, David. Great. Let's keep moving. So in summary, why Cairo? So first of all, because it creates what's called provable programs. It gives you the proof of computational integrity. And integrity uh, is, is the fact that uh, a certain output is actually the, the, the result of, of executing your program with certain inputs. So this proof allows you to verify a result without having to re-execute the computation. This is super important. This actually, this is the key of how we actually allow to scale the Ethereum ecosystem. Cairo is also a very powerful and flexible language in part because it inherits all of these um, features or syntax from Rust. And, and the validity proof uh, prevents cheating and malfunction, as you can see in the example that I gave you before, the supercomputer. Uh, so it's not only someone trying to modify, it's also the hardware failing that's going to be able to detect. So you can think of that it's a way to keep a supercomputer honest, just using a regular computer like a laptop or even a smartphone. Okay, let me see if there's more Q&A before going on. 
Right. Is there something like Solidity to Cairo Migration Guide? That's a good point. Uh, I haven't seen one myself. I don't know if anyone is aware uh, migration went from Solidity. I haven't seen I don't think one. so, but it will be very useful, yes. If you want to contribute to that, maybe you can do it in the Cairo book. So you can open a pull request or an issue, and it will be very, very appreciated. Yeah, for sure. All right, so why is stagnant? So let's start by discussing what is the issue that we have right now on layer one. Why is it so hard to scale Ethereum? So on Ethereum, you have uh, a node that is going to act as a block producer. So this node is going to get some transaction, and it's going to process them, and it's going to pro propose a new global state for the network. Let's say this state is a number 42, just to make it simple. So now that the producer proposes the block, every other node in the system is just not going to take the word for it. They're actually going to re-execute the same transactions of that block, and just to verify independently each one of them, that they all get the same results, that, that, that number 42 in this example. So here you can see that even a small computation actually has a profound effect on the whole network because it has to be re-executed over and over and over 10,000 nodes, and then consensus on top of that to see which one is, is the truth. Now compare that to how Stargate actually works. On a standard, the block producer is, is, is known as the sequencer. Uh, but the sequencer not only bonds transactions, creates a block, and proposes a new state. Let's say, again, the state is 42. But not only that, with help from the prover, also generates a validity proof out of the execution that arrived to that number 42. So now, what the layer one nodes need to do to verify that that is actually the state, the new state, the number 42, they don't have to re-execute the whole transaction in the same block. They only have to verify that validity proof that has been sent to have the same level of certainty of the output. And the verification of a proof is much cheaper than the re-execution of all the transactions in the block. This is what I tried to convey here with, uh, with this chart. So you can see now that it, it, even, even though now the block producer has to do more work because not only is to create a new uh, global state, it's also to generate the proof, the 10 thousands of computers on Ethereum, they only had to do a fraction of the work just to verify that proof and have the same level of certainty that is actually the output. So they don't have to re-execute the transactions. So how, the question is, how much do you gain by only having to verify the proof and not having to re-execute? So if you consider that the, the sequencer has to perform, let's say, n number of steps to derive the what is the new global state out of executing all the transactions in the block, then the verification of that validity proof associated with that computation is only log square of n. It's also called polylogarithmic. So that is the amount of effort that each one of the, the nodes on Ethereum has to perform to validate that n steps. So you can see in this chart the difference between the re-execution, which is the, the x or the blue line, versus only the verification of validity proof, right? The polylogarithmic. So the bigger the gap between these two lines, the more you save in computation to get the same level of trust. And this gets even much better with what's called proof recursion, which uh, I think is going to be touched on session five in architecture. This is just the baseline of how much you gain by using validity proof. It's actually much wider the line or the space between the two. So I like to think of validity proof that validity proof are to computation as the zip algorithm is to file size. It is a type of compression. Instead of compressing file size, you actually compress computation. So let me stop here for a moment, just take a look at questions quickly. Question is, how would you compare the computational effort required for generating proof versus verifying them? So the proof generation, uh, and we talk about proof generation, is also like knowing the output and creating the proof is x n log n. So it's it's called it's quasi linear, versus the verification is polylogarithmic. Uh, so once block produced, we don't need to wait for n blocks since proofs are there. Uh, right. Uh, so the question is pr pr pretty much how quickly are these proofs submitted to layer one? 
So we don't submit a single proof for each block because it actually, we haven't talked yet about data availability. Uh, the more frequent we send validity proof to layer one, the more frequent we have to send the data availability to layer one. And that is expensive computation, especially data availability. So we actually bundle multiple blocks into a single validity proof that we send to layer one, just to make it as cheap as possible. So the cost that you pay as a user on layer two is very low as well. If we, if we used to send, if we were to send a single proof for each block, it will make transactions on layer two much more expensive than they are right now. Uh, so you have two, level, two levels of finalities. You have layer two finality, and then you have layer one finality. And layer one finality is when the validity proof is sent to layer one to be verified, and that happens approximately uh, every 10 hours, which might seem a lot, but that's only what you have to wait if you want to withdraw assets from, from layer two to layer one. Compare that to optimistic rollups, which is basically a week. Okay, no more questions for now. So, okay, let's go deeper into validity proofs. So, validity proof is a use case of zero knowledge proofs that maybe you have heard before. So, we use zero knowledge proofs for compression, right? For computational compression. We don't use it for privacy. That is a very important distinction to make here because. Normally, would you equate zero knowledge with privacy, but it's not the case on a stagnant. It's only for compression. Uh, so the validity proof allows you to verify that the output is a result of the execution of a program with certain inputs. But you get the you get the benefits of compression is because to verify that output or verify that proof, you don't need to know the inputs. So we don't send the inputs to, to layer one. That's why the proof is so small compared to the computation. Uh, because we use validity proofs, we like to call a target a validity rollup. I know it's common to call ZK rollup, and that's okay if you want to call it that way. But the more formal thing will be validity rollup because we use validity proofs. And also, we use uh, you know zero knowledge proofs, but we use one particular called Starks, uh, and we don't use another one called Snarks. And what Starks allow is efficient proving and verification. So let's compare a little bit a Stark versus a Snark. Because if you've been on Ethereum for a while, you probably have heard about Snarks a lot, maybe all the time. So the verification of a proof on a Stark is a polylogarithmic log square of n, while the case of a Stark is actually constant. It's not dependent on how complex the underlying computation is. Also, the proof size of a Stark is actually bigger than Snark. It's actually in the hundreds of kilobytes. Snark is on hundreds of bytes. So looking at this, values you may think well snacks looks to be much better than stacks why do we actually pick stack for stagnant and not snacks and there are three important reasons first of all stack is has so much uh efficient proving time so almost like an, an order of magnitude uh, more efficient and that is very important because if there is a module or a node that is actually do a lot of computation is the prover the prover are very big machines, very powerful machines. So any game that you can have improving time, it's actually a big game, big game on cost and time. Also very important for a Starks, you don't require to have a trusted setup. Uh, you know, the secret that you have to fit into the system to make it uh, secure. You don't need that for a Stark, but you do need that for, for a Snark. So it means that when you have a system using seek a Snark, you have to make sure that that secret is properly handled because if it gets leaked, the system is compromised. Also, Starks are deemed to be quantum secure, while the Snarks are not. So it means that if a quantum computer comes online tomorrow with sufficient power, uh, the Snarks proof can be actually be vulnerable and broken, while the Starks uh, are not. Just because the only uh, cryptographic primitive that Stark uses is hash functions. And those are still considered to be safe in the face of quantum computers. Let me stop again for a while and check questions. Yeah. Is there a consensus algorithm to come consensus at the end of the node? Yes, between nodes. Yeah. So, okay. So right now we only have a single sequencer on a Starnet. So that's why we don't need a consensus algorithm, but we are developing one and actually tender means probably the one that we're going to pick because the next phase of a Starnet is actually to decentralize the sequencers. But right now, we only have one, so no need for consensus. Perfect. Uh, there's another question. 
uh, Jules is asking, CK proof of like decompressing computation. Does it mean that given a zero knowledge verifier program, one can decompress it to obtain the initial bigger program? So it doesn't work like compression in the same way as a zip file. It means that you can you can have the same certainty of an, of the output of a computation we ha without having to re-execute the computation, without having to have knowledge of the inputs. Because if I had to send you all the inputs, let's say in this case, all the transactions for you to verify, then the size of the proof is almost the size of the block. So you don't gain too much in, in that regard. And you will have to pretty much re-execute the whole thing just to get conclusion. Here, you only need to, you know, the, you know, follow the, the algorithm for, for stacks for the verification. And the size of the proof is very small, and the verification time of the proof is much shorter than the re-execution of the equivalent computation. There are a couple of questions regarding snarks. Uh, do we have time for them, or do we want to continue? And maybe we can wait a little bit. Uh, let's see. Let me see a couple of questions. Could you explain the trust set a bit more? I don't have that much knowledge. The only thing that I know is that. I know in Ethereum we're doing uh, the, the the ceremony. I think it finished recently, right? To be able to use snacks on Ethereum, so it means that you can do it. I mean, the right way, the Ethereum, the way, the way Ethereum is doing. But the question is: Is every other system out there that claims to be secure by snacks are going to do it the same safe way as Ethereum actually do it? That is debatable. Right now, you have to know not only that they use snacks, but how do they actually handle the trust setup? Basically, you have to create a secret key or a secret number. Uh, to fit the system. And in the case of Ethereum, that was done over multiple months, and I think thousands of people uh, took part of it. So it is possible to do it right, but it's difficult, and not everyone's going to do it right, like Ethereum does. Uh, okay, there's a lot of questions, but I don't have that much time to see. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Omar, let me know if there's a question here. Oh, uh, we have the name you, in the chat also, eh? Yeah, yeah, if you can understand the chat, I appreciate it because yes. time constraints. Right, so see, this is a common question that we get. Uh, why did we decide to go with the Cairo VM and not the EVM? So that makes that makes uh, two different types of rollups out there. You have the CK EVMs and you have now us, the Cairo VM. So of course, there's a trade-off. If you go the route of the CK EVM, you gain in compatibility, right? The fact that you can deploy a Solidity smart contract almost as if it goes to Ethereum or with little changes. But in the Cairo VM, you have to create your own smart contract in Cairo, completely different. So what you gain in compatibility for CT EVM, you might lose in performance and vice versa. We create a Cairo VM because we tend to maximize the performance that we can get from this new paradigm of zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so we have a more of a long-term vision for Cairo VM. So we sacrifice the compatibility in the short term to gain performance in the long term. And also we have to develop our, our own ecosystem of tools that at this point is actually quite mature. Uh, Vitalik wrote an excellent blog post a while ago comparing like different CK EVM or different types of CK EVMs. So let me go through those. those. So the type one CK EVM you basically can take any Solidity smart contract and deploy it as is to a layer two. Uh, it means that you will get full compatibility. You don't have to make any changes to your smart contract. The downside is that it's very slow because some things that are easier to do on a traditional computer as the EVM is are actually quite hard to do on a, on a, on a CPU that is uh, uses uh, CK circuits. The type two CK EVM are actually you have to do they do some changes on how they store data and how uh, or the data structure that stored data so you get high compatibility on the solidity smart contract not full you might need to modify certain things or some smart contracts might actually not work out of the box the performance is still slow but a bit better than type one and actually as you can see there's currently no project that is actually type one in production right now it's, it's, it's like a pipe dream at this point uh same with type two no project that i know of is a pure type two ZK EVM. But then we go to the type three ZK EVM. And in this case, you have to modify not only how the data structure for storage, but also the type of hash that you use and the pre-compiles. 
So then you can see that the support of solid smart contracts become partial. You have to make more changes. Some things might break. You have to modify. The performance is much better now. And now you have projects in this area. You have uh, CK Sync, you have Scroll, you have Polygon CK EVM, but you also have Kakarot, which is a project on a Starnet uh, that is going to become uh, online pretty soon. And it works as a, uh, almost like a, in a code interpreter, uh, like a bytecode interpreter between the EVM and the Kakarot VM. I, I suggest you to check it out. Kakarot is a very interesting project uh, that actually uses the Kakarot VM under the hood, but allows you to execute uh, EVM smart contracts. Uh, okay, so the type four CK EVM, uh, it actually uses a completely different virtual machine. So in this case, you have uh, no compatibility with Solidity smart contracts, but on the other side, you get a very good performance because now everything is optimized for this new architecture. And here you have, of course, a Starnet, and you also, also have a polygon mining. So the finality is something that I briefly discussed, I think, when I was answering some question. So on Ethereum, you get finality about every six minutes. On a starting, it actually takes 10 hours, unless layer one finality, because layer two finality happens also very quickly, and uh, less than a minute. Uh, but this finality is, is how fast can you actually withdraw funds from layer two to layer one? In case of starting, you have to wait until the associated validity proof actually gets sent to Ethereum and, and verified on Ethereum. But compare that to optimistic rollups, but the actual L1 finality is actually one week. You have to wait a full week before you can withdraw assets from layer two. But again, layer two finality is much faster. It's like a 30 seconds right now. So this trade-off against compatibility and performance actually now paying off on its target. As you can see, we have been able to handle peaks of transactions of 47.29 TPS. And this is using multiple. So each one of these transactions is actually multiple transactions bundled into a single one. So it's actually hard to compare uh, apples to apples when it comes to Ethereum, for example, because in Ethereum, you don't have multiple. Each transaction is just a single operation. And on, on, well, uh, maybe that changes with the uh, EIP 4337. Uh, but before that, it was single operation. So to summarize, so why is Tangent? First of all, because it's optimized for ZK technology, which gives you more computing power, but you pay less in gas fees. It is secured by the Starks ZK proofs and Ethereum, because we send this Stark proofs to Ethereum for every single node on the Ethereum network to actually verify independently. It has a very powerful programming language in Cairo. And it's actually a battle tested tech stack. It's been in production for two years. It has secured over a trillion dollar in transaction. That is a huge number if you compare like all the activity happened, not only on a StarNet, but also StarKex, because they actually share the same prover. And you can withdraw assets to layer one in about 10 hours, and it doesn't require a trusted setup. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty behind on time, so I'm gonna have to continue. Hopefully, Omar, Pierre, Kelvin, Robert, you can help me with the questions in the chat. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. All right. So before I talk about Cairo, let's talk about the past a little bit, the Cairo Zero, the previous iteration of the language. So Cairo Zero was released in 2020. It was a low level language and it has a very steep learning curve. This is the programming language that I, that I learned before I joined Starkware and it was quite difficult. I, I had, it reminded me a lot of assembly code that I used to do in university. Um, so even though it took advantage of ZK circuits and, and all, all the same type of uh, validity proofs, it has an issue that you couldn't, if you have a transaction that actually failed during execution, the system was not able to add it to a block. So that means that the sequencer will do all the job up until the point that the transaction failed, but it wouldn't get compensated. And that was a problem because that is a, a denial of service vector. So in the Cairo zero days, when you have a smart contract within in that language, you will compile it and it will compile it to the Cairo assembly. And this is a very low language, uh, language. We also call it CASAN for Cairo assembly. And then it will get added to a blog and a validity proof will be derived only if the execution didn't fail. Because if it did, did fail, it wouldn't be added to the validity proof. But now with Cairo, you used to call it Cairo one, but now I just call it Cairo. Now it's a high level language. 
that when you compile it, you don't compile it directly to car assembly. It now compiles to a language called Sierra. This is an intermediate representation, a safe intermediate representation language. So this is a way to decouple Cairo, the syntax, to the Cairo VM. So now these two things can evolve independently without having too frequent breaking changes. But another advantage of Sierra is that now Sierra is the one that generates the Cairo assembly. And it generates in a way that is safe. It means that the, if the execution fails, Sierra is able to gracefully handle that failure so it can actually be included in the block and thus be part of the validity proof. So this would allow for transactions, for failed transactions to be reverted, and also allows for sequencers to always get compensated, even if they try to execute a transaction that eventually fails. So no more uh, DOS vector in the system. So if you go back to a story, you know, the space exploration, we left off that you have Cairo, you get it to them, you get, get back the result, what's the proof? So let's take a, a deeper look into this example. So let's say that this is your laptop and that is a supercomputer. Let's see the modules that take part of it. So of course you start with the, your Cairo program. And first step is you have to compile it. And you compile it to, to Sierra, right? This intermediate language. So Sierra is the, 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 the program, the Sierra program is the one that you send to the supercomputer. And on their side, they actually compile it to Cairo assembly or CASM or safe CASM in this case. And they run it in the Cairo virtual machine. The Cairo virtual machine will give you the result that you're looking for, but then there's an extra step. From the execution of that code, a trace is created, and the trace is sent to a module called the prover, and that prover is the one that generates this validity proof that is sent over to you, and now you can verify on your computer very cheaply to know that the result is actually what you were expecting. Now, we try to keep evolving this architecture a little bit closer to how Stargate works. So this is the same uh, arrangement. It's just now that once you finish running in the Cairo VM, now the prover lives in a different node. And we're gonna call it Sharp, Sharp for shared prover. And one of the modules of Sharp is the prover. So now when we send the validity proof, we don't send it directly to your laptop, we actually post it to Ethereum. So any node can pick up that as a transaction and run the verifier, which basically is a Solidity smart contract that you can find it's open source. Right, so we're getting now very close to how a standard works, right? There are two modules, the sequencer and sharp. And, and on Ethereum, we have the, the nodes. So if we, if we zoom out and we actually take a look at how the transaction actually flows in the ecosystem. So all the transactions, they go to the sequencer first and the sequencer takes care of, of bundling the transaction into blocks and execute the transaction to know what is the new global state. And it does that with help of a program, of a Cairo program called the Starnet OS. Now the execution of those uh, transactions generates an execution trace that is sent to, the, to, to Sharp, where it has the prover. Sharp because it's shared between Starnet and StarkX. And the prover, once creates the validity proof, it sends it uh, to layer one as a transaction to the verifier, which is a smart contract solidity. So if the verifier says, yes, okay, this proof is valid, now the sequencer actually sends the state difference. So basically what changed from the previous state before I executed all these transactions to the new global state after I executed all these transactions in the block. And that difference is the one that is sent to another smart contract on Ethereum that we call the Starnet Core. And this is the data availability layer. This is actually the more expensive part of the system. This is where like 90% of the cost of a layer two transaction comes from for sending data to layer one for storage. Even though this is, this is then as called data, right? So this is the cheapest way that you can actually store data on layer one. Uh, you have full nodes and they actually get the latest block directly from the sequencer because right now we have a single sequencer. Eventually that's gonna be also decentralized. And the full node is the one, the thing that you use to actually get data for your smart contract, sorry, for your decentralized apps. You actually talk to a full node and the full node actually interact with the sequencer on behalf of you. And the advantage of using Ethereum as your data availability layer is now that you can, you're able to reconstruct the layer two global state just by indexing data from the standard core. So in case of uh, standard stops working tomorrow, you can still reconstruct the state directly from layer one without having to interact with the sequencer or the prover. So just to summarize, we have five main components on the standards. We have the sequencer that validates, executes, and bundles transactions into blocks. We have Sharp that creates validity proofs for a standard and a StarkX. 
We have the verifier, which is a layer one smart contract that verifies validity proofs from Sharp. We have a standard core, which is a layer one smart contract that stores changes to layer two global state, it's the data availability part. And then you have the full node that provide data to layer two apps. In, on a standard, you have uh, two steps to deploy a smart contract. You have to first declare the smart contract. And declare is basically to register the Sierra code of your smart contract on layer two. So declare is also known, or, or declare code is also known as a contract class, as you can see and the, on the right hand side. And the contract class doesn't have an internal storage, right? It's just, it's just the code, the code in Sierra. So you can use that contract class either as a library that you can call in the context of the caller just to execute the logic, but without storage, or you can use it as a blueprint. And use it as a blueprint because now you can deploy instances of this contract class. And that's what we call the deployment of a smart contract. So when you deploy a smart contract, you defer, first of, uh, declare the, the, the Sierra code, which is the contract class. And from this contract class, you actually derive as many instances as you want. And each one of them is gonna have a different address. And for each one of them, you're gonna have to execute the constructor. And these contract instances actually have internal storage. This is what you normally would consider to be a smart contract that you interact with. There are three types of transactions on StarNet. You have the deploy account that deploys an account contract, which is this is part of the account abstraction that we haven't talked yet. You can declare a smart contract. This is the fact that you register the Sierra code of your smart contract before to deployment. And you can also invoke, which is basically when you execute write functions of your smart contract, or in this case, uh, contract instances. And when you invoke uh, a function of a smart contract, you actually modify the global state. And because of that, you actually have to pay for gas fees. Uh, if you call a read-only function, that is not considered to be a transaction because it doesn't modify the global state. So you don't pay gas fees. But you see that there's no deploy transaction, right? There's only deploy account, which is for user accounts, for your wallet, and declare, but there's no deploy. And there's no deploy because we have a thing called the universal deployer. Basically, it's a smart contract that deploys other smart contracts, and it has only one selector, deploy account. So only one function is smart contract. So in order to deploy your smart contract using this universal deployer, you send an invoke transaction to that particular selector, and you define, okay, which class hash you're gonna use as a blueprint, and what are the arguments of the constructor for that uh, blueprint? So internally, this universal deployer uses a deploy syscall, yeah? not a transaction, just a syscall, like a library call. And this universal deployer was created by Open Zeppelin as a public good, so we all use the same smart contract to deploy. And right now it's within Cairo Zero, but eventually it's gonna be migrated to modern Cairo. And this is how it looks like. So first of all, you declare your smart contract, right? So you create the class, your smart contract class by declaring it. And if you want to deploy an instance of the smart contract, you're gonna send an invoke transaction to the universal deployer. And internally, the universal deployer is gonna use the deploy syscall. That basically, it's gonna use your smart contract class as a blueprint. It's gonna pass the arguments, and it's gonna create now the smart contract instance. The smart contract instance, what you normally refer as the smart contract, because it's the one that has internal storage. But I also mentioned that you can use smart contract classes as libraries. In that case, you can just declare that smart contract class. And now you can use a different syscall, it's called a library call, that you can call the logic of the smart contract class, but in the context of the caller, in this case, the, the smart contract, right? It's similar to it in Ethereum, you have delegate call. So two purpose for a declared smart contract, as a blueprint for creating instances or as a library. So summarize, uh, Cairo compiles to Sierra. Sierra allows for the creation of safe Cairo assembly. Uh, the standard nodes that we have on layer two are the sequencer, the prover, and full nodes. On a layer one, we have the verifier and a standard core, two smart contracts. Uh, when you compare deploy versus deploy, is similar to when you compare a class versus an instance. And we have three types of transactions, deploy account, declare, and invoke. Call is for free and you deploy by invoking a particular function in the universal deployer smart contract. Let me go back to the questions before we go to the break. 
Uh, let's take a look. So there's a question regarding a lot of questions regarding the prover. For example, so the proof does not contain the data, right? Question by Gilo. The proof does not, does not contain the input, the transaction details. Okay. How is the validity proof stored in layer one? Call data as call data? Um, I think so, yes. So you send the validity proof as call data. That's, that's how you do for send arguments to a function, right? It's call data. And then you you use the smart contract to verify that validity proof, right? And the output of that validation is actually stored in the smart contract, right? So basically, you have a, an identifier as the Kyra job, and then is it valid? Yes or no? A boolean. And and you have an array of those, so you can check. Oh, previous uh, validity proofs were they valid or not? Uh, but the detail, like the the whole validity proof, doesn't get stored in the smart contract. It's just, it, it, it gets, it survives just because the call data is kind of indexed as part of the logs of the smart contract. But it's, there's no storage that you can call in the verifier to, to get the, the full validity proof. But you can inspect the transaction and you can see the whole validity proof there. Also, you can see a lot of the, of the answers to your questions in the chat. There are very good questions and you can find the answers there. You uh, that King where she can learn more about deploying StarNet conference with the university deployer, you can look at the StarNet book. I will send the link through the chat and everything related to deploying, invoking, and overall interacting with the StarNet, you can find it on the StarNet book. And regarding Cairo development, you can find it in the Cairo book. There are two different books. Also, Pierre on session three is gonna create a smart contract from scratch and deploy it to test the using StackLine. So you can also just watch that talk and ask questions to Pierre when we get there. Maybe David, we can go into the into the break and we can keep answering the, the things in the chat, the questions in the chat. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Perfect. yes, thank you. So 10 minute breaks. So uh, yeah, I'll be back in a moment. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Davis. Okay, 10 minutes have passed. So um, for the second part of the session, I actually wanna give the floor to Ademola Kelvin. He's going to show us how to use Wallet, Bridge, and Block Explorer. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Kelvin, so you can share yours, OK? Um, all right. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so in this session, I'll be working on through um, creating a wallet and also how to like um, utilize um, facets and rich assets and also um, using the block explorer and also how to like interact with smart contracts. So um, basically the way accounts work on StackNet is quite like different from the um, uh, Ethereum we are used to because on Ethereum we know we have um, two types of, uh, type of accounts. You have the externally owned account and also the smart contract account. But with um, account abstraction, um, StackNet has just one account, just one account, which is the um, uh, represents uh, what do you call it, um, the smart contract account. So to create wallets, we know that uh, you have your blockchain, which is an entity on its own. So we need uh, a medium of way to like manage our private keys and also to um, create and sign transactions. So. Wallet serves as a way to um, do this, um, perform these actions. And on StackNet, we have two types of wallets. You have the Agent X wallet, and then you have um, Bravos. So um, to install. I'm sorry, Kelvin. Yes. Uh, let me turn you for a moment. Your screen looks very blurry. Oh. People in chat are saying the same thing. Really? Yes, it looks blur blurry, yeah. All right. And increase font size. All right, so the first step is just to install. Okay, so to install a, a wallet. And for that, you can use to Chrome. I think it's also available for Firefox. You can go to the web store. Uh, I'm going to install both. I'm going to install Browse. This is one wallet. 
and I'm also going to install Argent X. Right, so we have Bravos here installed. I'm just going to make it visible all the time. And then I'm going to install also Argent X. And those two are the main wallets on the ecosystem. So you just pick the one you like the most. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be using Bravos this time. So let me close here and open Bravos. So I'm going to create a new wallet here. I have to give it a password, whatever password, just a disposable wallet. Uh, of course, it complains because it doesn't like one, two, three, four, five. All right. Uh, yeah, so ideally, you will uh, reveal the, the recovery phrase and just offline, just store it somewhere. I know I'm going to reveal it here. So it's going to say that, yeah, I saved my recovery phrase. But please do in your case. And we're going to do this uh, test in, in Girly, which is the testnet for Starknet. I'm not going to use it on mainnet right now. And all right. So because on a Starknet, every single wallet is actually using a kind of abstraction, it means that every single wallet is under the hood implemented as a smart contract. And that is a smart contract we, that we have to deploy using the deploy account transaction. So let's get the test token because we need to pay for gas fees to deploy our uh, account contract. We don't have to declare it because declaration only needs to happen once per code base and Bravos already declared their own um, blueprint for these account contracts. So we can get test tokens from the faucet. In this case, uh, Bravos gives the link here, but you can also just Google it and you will find it. Uh, so let's click here and it should send me to the faucet. Here we are. Right. Uh, so the faucet is asking, OK, so to which address should we send these test tokens? Uh, so I can just, we can connect our wallet. Proof. And that actually auto completes as the, the, the address here. I just click here, I'm not a robot. And the motorcycles, OK, this guy. What else? Uh, you again. And send request. Okay. So let's wait a little bit while the. Okay. So we can explore this transaction hash. I think at this point it should arrive pretty quickly. Yeah. So it arrived. This is the money sent uh, from the faucet to our wallet. But our wallet needs to be deployed. So we have to click this setup to set up our account on chain. And this is the same. I don't know if it's Argent X does it for you automatically, but in case of browser, you have to do it this way. And we deploy it. And we have to wait. The sending the it's doing an invoke transaction to the universal deployer using uh, the contract uh, hash of the blueprint of browse. Let's wait a little bit. Look, it just costs uh, two cents, I believe. Uh, if we can see the transaction, oh yeah, the activity. You can see that account deployed, right? So now we have the whole thing uh, set up. Uh, remind me, Kelvin, what is the next step you wanted to show here? So um, after deploying the account, um, it's just like observe um, the transaction life cycle via um, right. this scan. Yes. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna copy the address of this account and we can go to a block explorer. We can use uh, Stark Scan, it's one of them. We have two block explorers, we have Stark Scan, and we also have Voyager. Yes. All right. So make sure you're in the you're in the test net because that's where we deploy our wallet. So I'm gonna paste here the address, and it's not showing up. Search and found, test account one. This is Curly. No, let me try and Voyager and test it. There is. And here. First of all, we can see that this implementation from Bravos is still in Cairo Zero. They're actually working on the Cairo One version of their wallet, but it's not yet available. Um, what can we see here? We can see the transaction, right? 
this was the initial transaction, the deploy account. Oh, actually, it, it did a deploy account transaction, so not directly the invoke. If we look at the detail, which one is it? Is this? Yes. You can see here the transaction life cycle. So the transaction was received and then was accepted on L2. The next step will be accepting on L1. But this is the finality that we need in, in layer two. Uh, this will be only will turn green when the associated block with this, uh, the block that was added to the validity proof is actually sent to layer one. And this happens once every 10 hours. So we, we don't need to wait until this happens. Uh, it's just more important when you want to withdraw assets from layer two. Right. David, if you could add a little bit more of Zoom, that would be great, yeah. please. Thank you. Create a transaction life cycle. Uh, Kelvin, what's next? Yeah, um, that, that would be um, bridging assets. Any questions so far about creating wallets and also um, um, the concept of counterfactual um, deployment? I don't think there are any yeah. questions. You can check maybe the, the, the chat. So, okay, so now I show you how to create a wallet, show you how to deploy a smart contract because you actually have to deploy a smart contract to uh, activate the wallet. Now I'm gonna show you how to bridge assets from layer one to layer two using uh, a bridge. So you can go to Starnet.io, the official website of Starnet. And in here, you should be able to see bridges and on-ramps. Close this. And you can see that we have multiple options. We have Stargate, Orbiter Finance, and Layer Swap. Uh, i just going to use Stargate, uh, one of the simplest ones to use. Mm, yeah. Uh, thanks a service. Yes, I accept. And this is the Stargate bridge. Now, to bridge assets from layer one to layer two, we have to connect two wallets. We have to connect MetaMask, and we have to connect, in this case, Bravos or Argent X. Uh, which reminds me that I have to install MetaMask here as well. So give me a second to install MetaMask quickly. Are you promoting MetaMask, David? Another password. Never, yeah, good wallet. Uh, Reminator. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. We have now MetaMask here enabled. So I'm going to turn switch to Gurley in MetaMask, right? Because if we're going to bridge assets, it needs to be from the same type of network. To bridge assets to Starnet Testnet, we have to bridge assets from Ethereum Testnet. So here, am I connected to which one? Mainnet. Yeah, so oh, yes, so I'm going to activate Gurley. So this is the Ethereum testnet connected to Starnet testnet, testnet Gurley. Of course, I don't have any test ETH here, so I'm going to send it from another account that I own. So give me a sec to send test ether there. I'm going to do it off, off screen, of course, because it's my real wallet. Just a second. Someone sing some uh, elevator music, please, in the meantime. Uh, Omar. <laughs> We're gonna put some Robert's going to put some Romanian metal for us. Is it good Romanian metal? Uh, yeah, yeah, could be, could be. Could be. Sounds like very <laughs> depends very on the hard. taste. <laughs> what do you like, Robert? Metal? Rayeton? Uh, I would say trans, most likely. Oh, OK, OK. OK, <laughs> okay I sent the transaction, so it's just waiting for Ethereum to pick it up. And OK, now we have it. You can see now we have 0 0.5 curly ETH in my MetaMask wallet. So let me go back to the Stargate. All right, so we're going to deposit from Ethereum to Stargate. I'm going to deposit. Um, OK, I need to connect the wallets first. So get started. Let's connect MetaMask. And why well, it's not picking up? What? 
Let me re refresh. Okay, now it's picking up. And uh, connect the wallet. Yes, connect. And oh, okay, yeah, I see an issue. I'm here minute, but actually it's girly that I have to activate. So let me do it again, but on girly, on minute. And make sure we are all on girly. Yes, girly. And this one is also. Yeah, yes, it's good. All right, on the wallets. Let's try again. Better mask. Next, connect. Okay, so that's connected. So now we go with the target wallet. We go with Bravo. So we have the test ETH. I approve the connection. Perfect. I have the two wallets connected. Click continue. All right, so I want to bridge 0 0.1. ETH, let's say, right? Uh, to start it, and I click transfer. So I have to approve the transaction on MetaMask to send these amounts. Yes. So this is showing also one feature of the is that you can send messages from layer one to layer two and vice versa. So this can be used for any type of bridges and even uh, an interesting use case that I think a snapshot is actually exploring is how to control assets that exist on layer one from a smart contract that exists on layer two. In this case, how do you do on-chain voting on layer one to control a treasury on layer, sorry, how do you do voting on layer two to control a treasury that lives on layer one? Um, okay, yes, let's see the transaction on Etherscan to see how it went. Uh, two confirmations. Hey, could you increase your zoom, please? Well, when you, oh, no, it's okay, it's okay. Right now, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for them, but yes. Let's check our Bravo as well because I don't think it has arrived yet because probably it needs to have multiple confirmations. Take some um, few only minutes. Have, I only have five. I think I have at least six confirmations. Okay. I don't know how many. Takes a little bit for the funds to be reflected here, but of course, this is what we had initially 3.23. Do you recall, Kelvin, how much, how long it took when you, you did it? Um, I think a um, few minutes, probably around like two minutes or three or so. All right. So, in the meantime, let me take a look at uh, see if there are more questions in the chat. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. No, I think everything has been answered by. Robert, okay. Pierre. So, yep. It should have reflected by now. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Look, at that. Look at how much money we have 165. Great. So, the bridging from layer one to layer two works on testnet. So, now uh, let's do the opposite transaction, right? I want to withdraw assets from layer one to layer two. Sorry, from layer two to layer one. We're going to use the same, same bridge. Um, I'm going to now go to the withdraw, right? And I'm going to withdraw the same amount, right? Uh, in this case, the same ETH, 0 0.1. Oh, maybe less because we had to pay fee, so we don't have the same amount. So let's do insufficient balance. Oh, 0 0.05, let's see. Refresh. Draw. 0 0.05. Okay, I need to refresh because didn't, it wasn't reflecting the new amount that I bridged in the first place. Mm -hmm. All right, from layer two to layer one, and I'm gonna check this box because, as I mentioned before, normally to withdraw asset you will have to wait ten hours, right? Because that's the frequency that we send related proof to layer one. But you can use this service from Space Shard that you can actually do the withdrawal much faster. You can read more here of how it works. I'm just going to use it because we cannot just wait 10 hours here. Uh, I'm going to click uh, transfer. So it opens my Bravos wallet. I can sign the transaction 0 0.05. Let's see the details. Uh, yes, this token. Okay, good. All right, sign. Initiate the transfer, probably. Well, it gives me the, the 
transaction hash I can follow. Uh, follow on view blogs, sure, but I can also view it on, let's say, view it on. Yeah, when, view blog, let's see what's. Yeah, this one is not showing, so let's see. Stack scan. Oh, there you go. It's already accepted on layer two. And uh, so this one is saying it completed apparently. And my MetaMask, I think that's it. Deposit confirmed. And it's a very fast withdrawal actually. So nothing, you don't have to wait the, the 10 hours as I mentioned. If you use that, you check that box uh, that I show you here to use this space chart service. Yes. Uh, so that's pretty much more things that I can show you from Block Explorer that might be interesting. If I go to, for example, Voyager, uh, you can see stats of the network, right? This is where I got the, the chart of the maximum speed. You can see the, the one that I took was from the max transactions per second. Uh, you can see here, this is the, uh, what are we looking at? Oh, because this is testnet, not mainnet. I, the, the, the stats that I showed you in the slide was from mainnet. On testing, it's small, so maybe we can switch to main it. So yeah. that's... And that makes more sense. So in the lag block, last block, the speed was 3.88 TPS. And this is the same peak that I showed you before, 47.29. You can also see the Cairo steps. And this is interesting just because I mentioned that we have multiple enabled meaning that in a single transaction, you can actually bundle multiple transactions. So that, that gives you an idea uh, of, of the complexity of those transactions. As, a, as the recent audit that we did on the target, the 0.12.2, we are now enabled transactions that can actually have 3 million steps maximum compared to 1 million that we had before. So that enables more complex use cases. For example, ZKML. ZKML is one that actually requires much bigger uh, transaction uh, and that's reflective of, of the number of steps uh, per transaction. Um, what else is interesting to show you? If we go the address to, book. Yeah, that's exactly it. Where do I find that one? I know where that is on a Stark scan. We're going to Stark scan because I know where to find a Stark scan, but there's a way to see very common uh, addresses that you will be using. So if I go to Stark scan <laughs> on mainnet. It's on the developers. Uh, developer. Yes, if you go to address book, here you can find, this is the core contract that I was told you about it. Uh, this is on Ethereum where the, the Solidity smart contract. Uh, this is the verifier that I mentioned, right? I mentioned that it's two layer one modules. Here it is. Then you have the address for ETH for the smart contract. Remember that on the StarNet, we don't have native tokens. Every single token is just an ERC20 token, right? It's, this is different from Ethereum that Ether itself is a, is a native coin, while wrapped Ether is the ERC20 representation. So technically, this Ether is really wrapped Ether. Uh, we have DAI, USDC, Tether, wrap BTC. Just some of, the, some of them that are just uh, commonly used. Of course, there are many more. This is just an easy to pick address book of the top. Content. And here you can find the address of the universal deployer, right? This is the, the I was talking about it. We can inspect it quickly. Not in much detail because this actually is Cairo zero, which is not the, uh, but you have an idea how the, the old Cairo used to look like. And you can see this much more complex with pointers and implicit variables. I mean, uh, it was horrible. Uh, now it's much, much better, but these Cairo Zero contracts, they still work on the network up until a certain point. At a certain point, we have to migrate every single smart contract to Cairo One because of the issue that I mentioned of the vector for denial of service uh, attack. So eventually, this is what we call the regenesis. Uh, all the Cairo Zero smart contracts are going to get disabled. And that's why it's important for you to check regularly your wallet because once in a while you will have to update the smart contract behind your smart wallet. Uh, if, if a new, especially if you had an old wallet, you created a wallet, let's say six months ago, you probably have to upgrade it to the new version. And whenever Bravos and Argent X deploy the Cairo one version of their smart contract, we will have to, you're gonna see a pop up here say, hey, 
uh, peso gas fees to uh, upgrade uh, your wallet. And that's it. What else is uh, worthwhile to showcase that I normally use? Um, top contracts, top collections, top accounts, stats. I think top contracts might be an interesting one. So you can find here interesting projects to interact with, avenues, you can learn the swap. Another interesting place to find information about what uh, contracts or what projects are available on Stargate is if you go back to the Stargate.io and you go to the ecosystem and dApps. I like this one, Stargate ecosystem. You can also use Dablan. But here we have a summary of pretty much all the projects that you can use on Stargate if it ever loads. There you go. So you can you can filter by the type of application you're looking for. If you're looking for, for gaming, uh, you can find it here. If you're looking for NFTs, here, nice, it's a nice way to, to find. And also interesting, you also can find jobs in the ecosystem, the Stargate ecosystem. So if you're looking for joining in certain role using Cairo and Stargate, it's also uh, a place to do it. All right. Yeah, um, one last thing, um, interacting with smart contracts. So I deployed um, a small contract for the demo, actually. I don't know if David could show yeah. that. Yeah. You send me the, okay, send me the address on Telegram. All right, so, okay, so this is a contract that has been deployed. So let's take a look, this is on testnet. Let's take a look at the public interface and it has only for reading, they get balance, right? And when you read from a smart contract, you don't have to pay for gas fees, it's for free, so you can query. So right now, balance is zero. But you can also write to it, and it exposes the method increase balance. So now to actually interact with the function, is gonna be sending an invoke transaction, so we actually have to pay for gas fees. So we need to connect our standard wallet. Click here, Bravos, that's the one where I have money proof and so now let's send some let's increase it to two right so i write uh, you can see here the details this is the function this is the mark contract this is the call data this is number two important sometimes to check this in detail i know that argent has even a mechanism to track uh suspicious addresses so it's an interesting service that you can use as well uh, sign transaction, and we can see here that it's actually going through. We can open the transaction on a block explorer. Open it, so we can follow. Oh, okay, already accepted. It was an invoke transaction function. Uh, we can see that's it. Yeah, so it went through. So if we go back to the contract, if we go back to the read we should be able to see now the new balance. Yes, two. So you see, it works. From here, you can also see the code, I think. Uh, you can see it's the Sierra code, which is not very useful because I think to see the Cairo code, you will have to verify uh, your code. I think Starks can have some tooling to allow you to do that. Otherwise, this is what it was deployed. Uh, if you go to the overview, I want to show you you can see the connection between the class instance that I was talking before, because this contract address is of the thing that we're looking at right now, is the, the one that has internal storage, but this is the, the blueprint that it came from, right? This is the, uh, Kelvin had to first deploy, he, he so, sorry, first declare, he got back this class hash, this is the identifier of the blueprint, and then he had to do the deploy using the universal deploy with sending an invoke transaction, so he had to pass this class hash with whatever constructor this uh, it is expecting. I think in this case, probably there was no constructor. Uh, it created this new address. You can have multiple instances connected to the same blueprint, each one of them with a different address. And you can see this is a Cairo one smart contract, right? The new syntax. Yeah, so um, that, that's it basically. That's the reason from my end. Uh, thank you, David. Awesome. Do we have any any questions here in the chat? All good, Omar? 
any questions or you took care of all of them? Omar? Omar is a... So question, how does CSPS relate to TPS? Uh, CSPS is carrier steps per second. Uh, so basically, because you can have multiple operations in a single transaction, CSPS gives you, let's say, a, a more useful view in the terms of the standard of the complexity of each transaction. But it's hard to compare apples to apples because every, diff, every single layer two seems to use a different reference for calculating. TPS is hard to compare from different projects because it all depends. In a single block, you can have a bunch of transactions, very simple ones that will give you a high TPS, or you can have a few transactions, but very complex one, each one, let's say, with 3 million steps, let's say, doing CKML. So that will give you a very low uh, TPS for a very high carry steps per second. I don't know if that makes sense. Question from Gonzalo. Is proving uh, more CPU or memory intense? Uh, I believe it's more memory intense. Uh, also, from proving, it's very easy to parallelize the proving process. That's why we are able to implement this recursive proving. Question from Lassisi. Can we deploy contract using ETH? Uh, yes, right now, the only token that you can use to pay for gas fees is ETH. In the future, we will have uh, the, uh, the Stark token to pay for gas fees. I think there's going to be a, a period of transition that you can pay for either one, ETH or Stark. But right now, because the Stark token is not available, it's not traded, anything, you have to use ETH. That's the only one. Uh, okay, right, so for the recording, for the homework, and for the slides, I'll be sending an email similar to the one that I sent yesterday, like reminded you of, of basically coming up today. I'll send another message to all of you where I'm gonna include links to all this information, including the recording. Um, and that's it. Uh, I know there's some issues with Discord. I've been talking with the, with the mods. Apparently the, the Discord invite is being closed, so I'm going to talk to them to see what's possible. But rest assured that all the information that you need, you're going to receive also by email. So you're not going to miss anything important there. This course is mostly to interact with your peers if you want to you know, solve homework together or something like that. All right, that's all for today. Thank you very much for all of you coming. I'll send you the email, and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.